Welcome everybody. Um, so apparently you guys somewhat enjoyed my bumbling attempt to explain semiconductors last time. Um, so by popular demand, we're gonna talk about more random stuff to do with circuits um, that kind of ties into industrial controls um, and a little bit into process engineering. Um, so some of this stuff you'll talk about in different classes at Davis, um, but they really dive heavily into the math to the point where it, it almost obscures um, the, basic, the basic principles in my mind. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna talk about from a very basic high level uh oh i have a question in the chat do we have class on monday not unless you want to um if you guys want to meet up monday i'm down uh we could just do a work shop session or whatever um so i guess email me and let me know if you want to meet up monday otherwise i'll plan not to okay so uh what are we talking about today well the first thing is i'm gonna share my screen dude this camera does not want to stay powered on. You were just working. One of these days, I'm going to get all my stuff figured out. We're not going to go through this little song and dance. just had this working two minutes ago. See, now you know how to do it. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is last time um, I showed you guys um, I was talking about PNP and NPN, and I showed you a simple diagram with a power source going to a PLC with the sensor and line like this, and kind of showed this as an equivalent circuit. Um, this is this is an oversimplification um, of what's actually happening, but it's just a good way. It's just a good way to think about the. Did I just freeze it? The reverse polarity. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. When you see vendor um, schematics of PNP or NPN, they're going to look like this um, because our sensor has three wires. And so when you wire the sensor up, what you do is you bring the positive brown wire to the positive terminal of your power supply. You bring the negative blue wire to the negative terminal of your power supply. And then you bring a wire from your negative power supply, negative terminal on your power supply to the common channel on your PLC. And then you bring the black wire from your sensor to your input on your PLC. Um, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you a heads up that if you see something like this, this is kind of the equivalent circuit to what we drew. Um, so it just it just looks a little bit different. Um, and again, that's all based on how transistor circuits work. Um, so go watch that video and look up more. Um, look up more if you're interested on that. Otherwise, now you know how to wire up sensors. Um, so that's that's one type of sensor. Um, so we, we talked about, so a little physical drawing of that sensor, it looks like this. And all it does is it shoots a laser across here with, with an emitter. And then it has a little um, photoreceptor on this side that, uh, that picks, picks up that laser. And, and then it's got your wire out, your input. And so anytime this gets blocked, um, this, this signal goes high or low, depending on how you ha have it set. But this input signal to your PLC goes high or low. 
um, and you read your input and it says this is blocked. Um, another type of laser sensor you could have is where there's no, uh, there's no receptor on this side. It just has a beam out. Um, and then it has, a, it has a detector here that is essentially um, looking for reflection. So if this beam gets broken here, whatever breaks it, there'll be some light scattering. And you could almost think of this as a camera and it sees that light scattering and picks that up. And that causes your signal to go high or low. So the disadvantage of this type of sensor is that it's um, not quite as precise um, and it will have a minimum or a minimum sensing distance. So there'll be some distance from the face of this um, that it basically can't sense stuff in front of it. Um, and depending on the sensor, you know, this could be a quarter of an inch or it could be um, a couple of inches um, depending on the total sensing length. So usually the farther this thing can sense stuff, the longer this minimum sensing distance is gonna be. Um, so we actually have at least one of those in our box of tricks. So that's uh, that's what this that's what this type of sensor is. And if you look um, on here, on the head of this sensor, there's a little dial that you can set, and that actually sets um, that sets the uh, trigger trigger distance sensitivity. So you can you can adjust that. Uh, minimum trigger distance. Um, so basically what you would do is if you had, once you install this thing and you know what you're trying to, what kind of objects you're trying to sense, you basically put that object at your average sensing length and dial this thing in um, to where it's just, it just starts triggering and then you go a little bit further. And then, and that's how you set it. Um, and then it's got a it's got a little selector switch um, for whether it goes high to low or low to high on sensing. And so if you remember that high to low, if you think of this as your as your signal, you have zero volts, twenty four volts, and this the this axis is time. So here's your sensor, and then right here in time you trip it. Low to high means your input voltage goes high to 24 volts, okay? Um, so you could, also, you could also kind of think of that as normally open. Alternatively, you can have it set to where that signal is normally high, and when it gets blocked, it drops down to zero volts off, right? Um, so depending on what you're doing, uh, you wanna set that sensor to be normally high or normally low, uh, because that way, if it if you lose power it fails it either uh so if you have it normally high and you lose power it fails open right or uh or sorry it fails closed so your input gets triggered and that so depending on what you're doing that might be a good thing or it might trigger an error condition and you can go check out your equipment um so that's just one of the things when you're when you're configuring a sensor you want to think about, do I want my signal to go high or low, or uh, do I want it to go low to high or high to low? Um, and you want to think about your failure mode. What happens if I lose power only to that sensor or somebody cuts my wire, right? Um, it's just, it's an aspect of your design that you really want to be considering with this sensor. Okay, so these are, these are optical sensors. Um, they're super useful, super easy to implement, um, but they do have a major drawback or a couple of major drawbacks. Anybody tell me what those are? Nobody? No, nobody can think of any potential problem with having sensing based on uh, visual light. This stuff is a problem. So the, um, what can happen is if in an industrial setting, you can just get dirt 
or crud on your sensor and it'll block the light and it won't work correctly anymore. Um, so we actually had that, uh, we had that happen on a conveyor system where um, we were basically built our own encoder similar to what we did uh, with that motor. So if you guys remember in class, we had our motor, our motor here with our little flag and this was spinning and blocking the, the laser sensor, right? Well, we had that um, configured on a packaging line and uh, that, that sensor eventually got clogged up with, um, with like the cotton that they put in pill bottles. Um, little little fine, uh, fine bits of that clogged up the sensor and it just stopped working correctly. So um, all they did is they just added a, yeah, false positives. They added a, um, a monthly maintenance task to just go and clean the, clean the sensor and make sure it's free. But um, there, you know, another potential alternative way of sensing, um, or there, there's many other sensor types, um, but there's one really common one uh, that doesn't have this problem. So that next kind of sensor is called a Hall effect sensor. Okay, and what it is, is a, it's a P uh, type doped semiconductor. And on one end, you have a voltage source connected. And then uh, on the other end, or the, the other faces of this rectangle, you have leads coming off and you have a voltage sensor. Okay, so what this does is you have a current flowing through here, or this way, um, and when you, let's see, let's see, negative, positive, so your current's flowing this way, and if you introduce a magnetic field onto this semiconductor, it causes um, deflection of the electron, or uh, yeah, of the electrons and the holes in this semiconductor. Um, so if you remember, if you have a B field in the area. So again, I'm not gonna talk about, pretend like I know the physics of how a semiconductor works, um, but what this does is this introduces a measurable change in voltage potential between these two points. And so your, your handy dandy little voltmeter um, can, read, can read that voltage change. And so if this is hooked up to a computer, if this is an analog input on your PLC, as you move this B field generator in and out away from your sensor, you will see pretty much a linear increase in voltage, more or less. Um, so that's voltage, that's distance. And so what you can do is, I mean, you could, you could just straight read this as an analog value if you wanted to, um, and you could actually, in, to some extent, use that to uh, measure linear position of your magnet. Um, but the other thing you can do is basically just uh, set a threshold voltage value. And so when this voltage value reads above that threshold, you turn your input on. And that's more commonly how this is used. Um, and so this is called, this physical pheno phenomenon is called the Hall effect. Um, so this would be a Hall effect sensor. And usually this is configured where you have, a, I think it's like that, you actually have a magnet and then you have your Hall effect sensor. Um, and this is your instrument here. And this is all wired up back to your PLC. Um, and so having the magnet permanently installed here, um, you can actually sense metal objects coming, coming in close proximity to this Hall effect sensor. Um, so this, this, you know, let's just say this is some ferrous, ferrous metal object. If you bring this here, you'll trip this Hall effect sensor. And so you can use that as a switch. So, um, what you can do with that is install, um, 
for example, on our motor, if you have something that's spinning, you can install little metal blocks on that. Um, or you can, uh, you can get a Hall effect sensor that doesn't have a magnet and you can just put magnets on here. And so as this is spinning, you'll sense it spin past, um, spin past your sensor. However, uh, and you can create an RPM, um, an RPM gauge this way. So this is actually probably a better way of doing it than what we did. Um, because it, you can basically just, your parts are more secure. Um, instead of having to have a visual flag gate, you just need to bring these in close proximity. Um, so this setup, this configuration is actually used on like, uh, on race cars. You put these, uh, you put a Hall effect sensor in there and you put uh, markers on the drive shaft. Um, and that's actually how they'll, um, some, some race cars actually measure uh the uh rpm of the drive shaft to the to the rear diff um and then if you know like if you know your transmission specs you can you can correlate that to engine rpm uh or, or whatever so that's a pretty cool application um and we have somewhere yeah i was using the backside so we actually have um a proc sensor uh, this is one of the many awesome things that Automation Direct donated to us. Um, so you can see here, it's got it's got a cylindrical body um, that's a threaded shaft, and it comes with these two these two nuts. And so basically, you just drill a hole in a metal plate, stick this through it, and stick the two nuts on either side of it. Um, and you know you can custom design your fixture that way. Um, ah. Black screen of death strikes again. There we go. Yeah, so you can design a custom fixture that way. So my uh, one of the things I was going to try to get you guys to do this quarter is print, um, basically print a sprocket. So that'd be your little keyway. Um, print a sprocket with little insert spots for pieces of metal or magnets or whatever and then print some kind of fixture to hold that proc sensor um so that we could uh so that we could basically create another um huh what's the word for this tachometer so that we could create another tachometer using this other type of sensor so that would have been a that would have been a cool like 3D printer project, um, and hopefully next year uh, when they continue the club, somebody can do that. So I'm going to write up write up a uh, job instruction for how to do that next year, and hopefully somebody decides to carry on the legacy. Um, any questions on that? Sweet. You guys, I, man, you guys fell asleep quick. I was expecting you to make it at least another 10 minutes. Okay, dude, I don't know. I don't know why it keeps shifting the zoom angle too. This thing is so freaking weird. I don't know if it's the GoPro or the module I'm running it through, but they do not like each other. They're like step brothers. Hopefully by the end of this, they'll be best friends and start a band. Okay, so that's uh, that's basically object sensing, right? That's a that's a very important kind of instrumentation. The next thing I want to talk about is temperature. So, in your um, in your one forty five lab series, I think um, I can never remember class numbers. You're gonna make what's called a thermocouple. Okay, and a thermocouple is made by taking uh, two wires made up of dissimilar metals and welding them together in a little point here. Um, and what, what that allows is um, 
it, this, this takes advantage of what's called the Seebeck effect. Um, I think it's two E's. So the Seebeck effect, um, essentially, if, if you have two dissimilar metals like this joined together, um, at different temperatures, this induces uh, a voltage across, across this junction. Um, so it basically, it, it creates voltage. Um, and it's usually really small. I mean, it's like on the order of, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think maximum you can get is like a couple volts out of this. Um, so basically all you do is just connect a voltmeter on either side of this. Um, and then you stick this probe into usually into a, a liquid, uh, whose temperature you want to sense. And you just take a take a reading on that voltage, and you'll have some coefficient, um, some alpha coefficient. That's your Seebeck coefficient, and it basically correlates like, you know, you'd say 0 0.01 volts per degree Celsius change, right? And you'll calibrate that over some range. And so, this just lets you, um, this lets you get a pretty good temperature reading, um, and actually. These have been around for a really long time. They're super well documented. Um, there's different types. Uh, the most common are J, I want to say J and K types. Um, I think if I remember right, type J is alumel and nickel um, wires. Um, and usually you get an accuracy of, um, you can get an accuracy of like plus or minus half a degree Celsius with this. So these are super cheap and easy to make. Um, actually, my first my first real job out of high school um, was I was a validation check, and we had a machine um, called a K validator, and you basically um, made you just made a bunch of these wires, hooked them up to the K validator, and stuck them into this uh, really expensive temperature bath that could control temperature really well. And you just calibrate these things, and then you use them to take the take the temperature of um, like refrigerators that are used to store pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. Um, okay, so another uh, I guess another way you can measure temperature is um, different metals have different coefficients of thermal expansion. So if you have two metal bars like this that are different metals and you heat them up or cool them down, um, these will elongate or contract at different rates depending on what the metal is. So if you, if you increase the temperature of this, you'll get some bendiness to it. Um, and ultimately, this is really what's happening at a microscopic level inside this weld bead um, that's inducing, inducing the voltage change. Because what's happening is um, uh, oh, I kind of misspoke a little bit. This this voltmeter also has to induce um, induce a current in here. No, wait, I don't think that's right. Disregard what I just said. Anyway, so this, this, change, this change in physical shape introduces a physical change um, in the resistance of this component. So uh, the Seebeck effect is taken advantage of in a huge number of applications. Um, the probably the coolest, in my opinion, is is deep space probes. Um, so actually, the way it works uh, is they have a big chunk of radioactive material in this casing that has fins coming off, and so this uh, this radioactive material in here is deteriorating and releasing heat.
And as that heat's released, it goes out these fins and these fins are in space um, and they get cooled off. And they basically use, um, use some really fancy circuitry uh, to harness the Seebeck effect and actually harness power um, from that. So they're getting those deep space probes are, uh, I want to say they're powered off like 2.5 volts or something. Um, it's, it's not a lot of voltage at all, um, but that's how they power because long term they can just, they can pretty uh, reliably generate power um, using the uh, decay from this nuclear material. Um, and basically, the the guys at NASA figured out, okay, we're gonna start out over time um, using this effect. We're gonna uh, we're gonna generate, you know, however. Okay, let's just say five five volts. And over time, as that nuclear material decays, we're gonna get less and less and less and less voltage out of this thing, right? Um, and so. They basically planned out like at the start, we're gonna run all our cameras and sensors. And then as time goes on, as we lose voltage, we're gonna start shutting down equipment on that um, probe um, to, because we're just not gonna have as much juice um, available. And so, um, so they're, they're basically only running like the more, the more important sensors on that probe. Anyway, I, I think that's super cool. Um, the other application or the other application that I know about that's pretty cool for the Seebeck effect is um, you can actually run a refrigerator using this. So instead of um, so yeah, so this is why I know I misspoke over here. This change in potential induces a current um, in this circuit, whereas um, if you go the other way. And you have a big metal block with with fins, um, and you induce a current through it. Um, you'll either you'll get a flow of heat into or out of this metal junction, depending on which direction you flow the current. Um, and so you can actually use this on as a refrigeration or a heater um, without having any moving parts. So normal normal refrigerators, uh, as you may know, they have coolant, they have a compressor, they have an expansion orifice, they have all this like complicated um, physical hardware that gets degraded. And if you get water in there, it just craps out and eats up the compressor blades and super expensive and, and fairly prone to failure. Um, and then in, in, some, in some industrial applications, the, the coolant they use um, is actually like super, uh, super hazardous. Um, so if you, if you have a failure, failure it's really bad. Um, so this Seebeck cooler, Seebeck effect um, refrigerator is super useful um, where, because you don't have any moving parts. And so it's less, um, it's less uh, susceptible to like shock and, and damage in an industrial environment. So you'll actually see this used on um, control enclosures like ours, if it's like a motor, uh, motor control cabinet. Sometimes they'll put a refrigeration unit um, that uses the Seebeck effect to cool it down, which when I learned that, I just thought it was super neat. So, okay, enough about physics that John doesn't know. Um, so on to, on to the next one. Um, so the thermocouples are pretty useful. Um, they, uh, they're pretty commonly used when you don't, when you need like within, when you need accuracy within like one degree C, right? Um, cheap, easy to make, pretty reliable. Uh, but not the most accurate thing in the world. So the the Mac Daddy of temperature measurement is the resistive temperature device. So pull up my diagram notes here. Um, 
So again, at face value, this, this looks pretty similar to a thermocouple. So basically you just have a resistor. This resistor is in a probe. Um, and then you have a ohm meter, a voltmeter, uh, measuring the potential across this resistor. And so when you change, when you change the temperature here, um, you'll, you'll change the resistance and you can measure that change in the resistance with your, uh, with your ohm meter. Um, now, usually these RTD probes have basically like a thermal well, and then they have the actual resistive element inside of it. Okay, and this is what the circuitry is attached to. And then inside this well, they'll have some kind of super fancy packing, um, which might be like pure sodium metal or something, something really nice and conductive. Um, and so usually these RTDs um, cost on the order of, you know, a hundred, hundreds of dollars. Um, so then usually the RTD has a, uh, an integrated circuit board um, that has basically a signal transducer. So it reads that voltage, changes that into a four to 20 milliamp signal. That analog signal goes back to your controller. Um, so this is this is more common in like uh, in permanent installs and processes. You'll you'll more than likely see RTDs and not thermocouples for measuring temperature, just because it gives you a much higher degree of accuracy. Now over here, I showed you this is a two wire RTD, um, and so you have you have your wires running back to your controller. And these can be really long, like, you know, you could have a hundred feet or more of wire. Does anybody see a problem with this setup? Can anybody, can anybody think of a potential issue? Exactly, voltage drop. So you're, you have an inherent resistance in your wires. And so if your wire length is really long, you actually have to um, calibrate that into your control system. Um, so you'll have, you'll have a voltage drop inherent in those wires. But in reality, those wires are just like this resistor where they're sensitive to temperature. So ambient temperature drift in your warehouse where these wires are run, run will actually induce uh, a voltage change in your reading over, um, over that length. So, Basically, the longer this wire is, the more potential you have to get a false temperature reading. Um, and so, uh, I gotta get my notes to make sure I draw this correctly. Okay, so the way that that's avoided is using what's called a bridge circuit. So you have your, you have your RTD, um, resistor, and then you have a wire here. Um, and you have, actually, I don't know why I drew it that way. You have a battery, and you got another resistor here. Sorry, I'm going to slow down and draw a little bit better. And then you have your voltmeter. And you have another resistor. So all these resistors are the same resistance. Usually it's like one ohm or something. And then this is your this is your sense, uh, your sense resistor. So this is the one that that varies in uh, varies resistance. And so um, this configuration, which is called a bridge circuit, um, essentially allows allows you to measure at this voltage source only the change in this voltage it's it's insensitive to or at least once you calibrate it 
um, basically all these wire lengths are the same and any temperature drift um, or any, any voltage drift from temperature change in these wires is essentially negated um, by, this, uh, by this circuit configuration. And so you're only sensing, you're only sensing change in resistance and you're sensing, sensing element. Um, so the only downside of this is now you got to run four wires back to your controller rather than two. Um, but usually that isn't really that big of a deal. And if you remember, um, all, all of this circuitry is contained right here. Um, and so if you have, if you have this, uh, configuration where your field device has an integrated circuit with a transmitter on it, you're really just running a super short run of four wires into here, um, into your control board. And then your four to 20 signal is still just a two wire um, home run back to your controller. How are we doing so far guys and gals, people? Super thrilled, huh? I can't tell if uh, if you guys are enthralled or uh, zombified. I'm tired. Yes, yes, you are. Good. I'm I'm glad you're one of those things. Um. Okay. So the last thing we'll talk about in detail is pressure. So as you know, fugacity is pressure. If you don't know that, you will know that. Partial pressure. Partial pressure. So. Hey, hey, don't don't name names in this class. <laughs> so uh, we talked about this a little bit before. Um, how, you know what? I'm just going to share. Rather than trying to redraw this, I'm going to share a picture. Over here. Um, can everybody see that super nice diagram there? Cool. So, um, ye -ye. so basically, the way this works is you have a metal tube that has this uh, this gnarly cross-sectional geometry. Um, and so as pressure increases in this tube, this tube wants to straighten out um, and pull, basically pull up, which pulls on this linkage arm, uh, which goes through the gears and pivots the needle. Okay. So keep that image in your mind and we're going to go do a little drawing. Okay. So you got your shepherd's crook shaped board on tube, your linkage to your pivot needle. Okay, and the cross section here is kind of ovular. And so if you increase pressure of your fluid or your, uh... You gotta watch that video. Oh, you guys are, you guys are killing me. You're sharing YouTube videos in a <laughs> discussion? Uh, I got to go watch that video in a second. We're almost done here, guys. Okay, so if you increase your uh, your fluid pressure in this tube, it's going to want to straighten or it's going to want to uh, expand into a circular shape. Um, and so that expansion just causes a, a straightening of this tube. It's going to want to go that way. And so it's going to pull on that linkage and your needle is going to spin. So this is like your... Um, garden variety pressure gauge um, that we talked about before. So like, you know, you just, when you see a little dial pressure gauge, almost always it's got this kind of internals. Um, and if you guys remember, you can hook up, you can hook this up to a potentiometer or a rheostat, right? That's mechanically linked to this, um, to this needle. And you can get, you can measure the voltage change based on this position. Um, and get that as an input to your um, to your controller to to measure pressure. So that's one way. That's the that's the cheap um, simple way. Um, there's another. 
super duper fancy um, pressure sensor uh, called a strain gauge. And so basically this is a, this is a flat sheet of flexible material um, with a metal filament, a metal wire inlaid into the membrane. Um, and so you can see from this picture, um, the, as your pressure increases or decreases, your membrane flexes and increases or decreases the, uh, the resistance in that, um, in that metal filament. Um, and so, so if you have your little strain gauge, you have this hooked up to an ohmmeter. As this changes, you can measure the, or you can measure the change in resistance in ohms. And so this is the nice thing about these strain gauges is these can be manufactured in really small, um, small configurations. And so you can have a little tube with a threaded end, and this might be um, a quarter quarter inch diameter on this tube. It's it's really small. Um, you don't need all this big. Uh, mechanical linkage like you would for this type of uh, for the board on tube type of pressure gauge and then you just have a wire out to your controller and you can use that to measure the measure pressure in your system um, the other cool thing is like is that you can you can create a small mechanical linkage between this diaphragm um, and some more robust type of uh, type of material in front of it and so you can install this in really, uh, really hostile environments um, without damaging your sensor. So this, uh, this is the more, this is the more common type of pressure sensor that you'll see in heavy industry. Um, so I have, we got about five minutes left. I have some notes on flow measurements. If you guys want to talk about that, or we can wrap it up here. What do you guys feel like? Let me see that flow. Let me see that flow. Okay. So if you've taken fluids or a physics class, you probably remember talking about Venturi tubes. And basically what you have is you have a restriction. I mean, if you have, um, if your mass flow rate is constant, which it should be through this, um, then your linear velocity is going to increase through this restriction, which means your pressure is going to decrease, right? Um, and so basically, you just uh, put two two small intrusions into your process hole, um, and you have a special you have a differential pressure gauge basically um, between those two. And so, oh, that's an ugly drawing. Okay, but you get the idea. So you're, you're taking a pressure measurement here and you're taking a pressure measurement here. Um, and then you're doing a calculation uh, based on that delta P. Um, what is my, uh, sorry, what is my mass flow rate? Um, you also need to know the density of your fluid. Um, and you and this assumes incompressible fluid flow through through this restriction. Um, so this is this is actually super common. Um, this is probably in heavy industry probably the most common measurement of, of flow in pipes. Um, the other configuration for this it's it's pretty similar um, is an orifice plate. And so in your pipe, you basically just have you got your pipe here, and then you just have a restriction with a hole in it. Um, and so the if you if you rotate this 90 degrees, this basically is just a metal plate with a hole through it. Um, and there's different geometries for this. So like, if you're worried about having um, entrained solids, you might your orifice might look like a little smiley face, 
right? So this is this is your hole. So that way your solids don't get stuck up against the face of this orifice plate. And your orifice plate looks like a happy smiley face, right? But really all you're doing is um, uh, just measuring the pressure across those. So uh, typically on these installations, you'll, you'll just have a differential pressure gauge installed right on there. You could also do this yourself if you, for whatever reason you have, um, like if you if you do this at home, if you have, because you can get those board on tube pressure gauges for like 10 bucks. So if you got the tools and the wherewithal, you could slap, you could make your own orifice plate, slap a pressure gauge on either side of this, um, take pressure readings and do the math to figure out your flow rate through this pipe. Um, so that's the cheapest and most reliable. The downside of this is eventually these orifice plates are precision manufactured and over time they do get worn out. Um, and so over time you, you'll get a little bit of drift in your, um, in your flow readings um, and you gotta go replace them. So usually um, like at a refinery or somewhere, they just have a PM for when they go into a shutdown, they just go replace all these, all these orifice plates um, to guard against that. Um, so the other, so flow is, uh, I want to say far and above the trickiest thing to measure. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of different devices besides, besides this style that introduce less, um, intrusion into your process. Cause the problem with a Venturi tube or a, uh, or an orifice plate is you're, you're introducing a restriction in your flow. Um, so you're just, you're kind of, um, you're, there's an energy loss associated with that. Um, so one other, one other thing is like a rotometer where basically you just have a box and this thing gets spun by your flow. It's kind of like a, kind of like a paddle wheel and it gets spun around and you can measure the RPMs of that. That's not a very accurate, um, way to measure flow, but it does work, um, all of this stuff requires extensive calibration to make it work. Um, another way is if you have a pipe, um, is a, a ultrasonic. And so what this does is you'll have a, a ultrasonic beam that goes through here and you got your stuff flowing through. Um, and this will actually, hit the stuff in your pipe and scatter and get picked up by, by these uh, sensors as well. Um, that's super expensive, um, but it can be, um, it can be super accurate. Um, the other super nice thing about this configuration is it doesn't require you to cut into the pipe or add anything into the process stream. Um, so there's actually, uh, there's actually ultrasonic flow meters that you can go and temporarily install by strapping it onto the, the outside of a pipe. Um, and that a lot of, you know, if, you, if you're wanting to do some, some field research, um, that'll let you get a flow reading. Um, if, depending on, depending on your process fluid in this pipe, um, you can use, uh, there are magnetic flow meters. Um, but that only works with certain certain types of process fluids. Um, so it, it kind of works similar to the ultrasonic. I get you, I think you get the idea. Um, the last kind is called the Coriolis flow meter. So you got your pipe, and you got these two tubes that are um, piped in parallel, and and your process flow flow goes through it, and it causes them to flex. And there's all kinds of super complex circuitry involved with that um, that I definitely can't explain in the time we have left, but it allows you to measure flow and it also allows you to measure density. Um, so these are super badass, but they're really expensive. Um, so if you're interested, go look up Coriolis flow meters. Um, super, super nice instrument for, for measuring uh, flow of a process fluid. Um, I'm gonna cut it off there because we're out of time. Y'all got any questions? 
So actually quickly, last thing before we go, um, this is just a sampling of the stuff that's talked about in these documents that are is in the ChemiCAD reference materials instrumentation folder. Um, there's all kinds of awesome stuff in here. I, I highly recommend you go take like 20, 30 minutes and just go read about control valves. Um, there's a whole seminar on control valves. I didn't get to this. I, we could talk about this next week if you guys want. Um, if you want to just, if you want to on Monday or even Wednesday, if you want to get together and talk about this, we can. Um, but understanding like the different kinds of control valves that are available for use in, uh, in process industries, super important as a chemical engineer. Um, and they didn't, honestly, they didn't really spend a lot of time on this in 158B um, because from, from a math standpoint, um, the, the stuff you calculate for control valves probably gets um, really complicated at like a graduate level. Um, but at the, at the undergrad level, it's, you know, uh, it's fairly simple. So they didn't, they spent like one lecture on that. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's less important to be able to do calculations about valves than it is to understand, you know, the different internal geometries and their applications and what you can use them for. Um, so yeah, go read up on that. Email me if you want to meet on Monday um, and what you want to do. If you want to do like a workshop session, if you want to just talk about control valves, if you want to just insult me and look at my dogs, I'm, I'm down for any and all of those. So let me know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill the recording.